Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. It is uh, episode number question mark, and we will be covering the John Carpenter classic question mark, The Fog from 1980, I believe. I was about to correct your question mark there, but then you actually led it into a further joke, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, from 1980, though it was actually filmed for a 1979 release, but then they went back and reshot portions of the movie, but I'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's directed by John Carpenter, which is surprisingly something that we actually do need to specify these days, because we haven't done a John Carpenter film in a while. <laughs> in a long time. I mean, when Elvis, was the he last directed, yeah, you Elvis. could kind of say Someone's Watching Me, I think would probably be the last one to qualify. Mm -hmm. That and Halloween. But yeah, we had Elvis, we had Better Late Than Never, and so this is our first time also getting a John Carpenter score since Halloween. Absolutely. I would say that this feels like the next John Carpenter film after Halloween, because it's not mm -hmm. TV or, I was going to say directed video but they didn't have that back then. Yeah. So it definitely feels like we are doing the next John Carpenter film after Halloween. Yeah. And starting a very impressive run soon. Yes. This is, I think, like the last of the gearing up. Mm-hmm. Yep. And this one, he co-wrote it with Deborah Hill, who produced again, who was his partner at the time. If your ears caught any familiar names among the characters in the film, Nick Castle, Dan O'Bannon, Tommy Wallace, and Cobritz are all named after people Carpenter knows and has worked with on past films. Uh, according to the commentary, a few of the women are named after old girlfriends of his. Oh, wow. The uh, boat captain, Al Williamson, is named after the famous comic book artist who worked on a lot of the EC horror titles, and we'd probably best know from his comic adaptations of Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi from the early 80s. Oh, very cool. And the coroner, Dr. Fives, is named after the Vincent Price movie. Of course, that one, yeah. <laughs> did you recognize the coroner? I did. Mm, did you? Well, I mean, I don't know. To me, he looked like Stephen King, but I don't know who he actually was. <laughs> That was Darwin Joston, who played Napoleon in Assault on Precinct 13. Oh. He looked familiar, but I didn't Did he? Know. Yeah, he looked a little different. You should have asked someone if they got a smoke. That's right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so we got a lot of names to go through here because most of the cast and crew are carryovers from Halloween. I was going to say, yeah. Uh... Yep. We've got actor Charles Cyphers, Nancy Kyes, a.k.a. Nancy Loomis, and Jamie Lee Curtis now being joined by her mother, Janet Lee. We have cinematographer Dean Cundy, along with his assistant cameraman Christian Rao, camera operator Raymond Stella, gaffer Mark Walther. We've got editor Charles Bornstein. We've got editor, production designer, and ghost performer Tommy Lee Wallace. Uh, associate producer Barry Bernardi. Art director Craig Stearns and his assistant Randy Moore. Production manager Don Burns. Boom operator Joe Brennan. Stunt director James Winburn. Electrician Steve Mathis. Key grip Dylan Shepard. Music coordinator Bob Walters. And orchestrator Dan Wyman. So this is very much the group that made Halloween reformed and made this. I think the lady who made the muffins for Halloween was involved as well. <laughs> <laughs> they just Probably. had to have her back. It's Those morning glories. It's true. Yeah. Gets a little lady started. <laughs> <laughs> and then returning from some of Carpenter's other films, we have Adrian Barbeau, Darwin Joston, and James Canning, one of the fishermen on the boat, was also in Elvis as one of the band members. Assistant director Larry Franco. Special effects supervisor Richard Albain, and the bartender is played by Bill Taylor, who is the effects supervisor on Assault and Matt Painter on The Thing, but otherwise doesn't appear to have worked on this one. He just showed up and played the bartender. Nice. A family affair. Yes. And a few new names to add. This is the first where we'll see actor Tom Atkins, who will again show up in Escape from New York and Halloween 3. The child actor Ty Mitchell, who plays Andy, will show up again in Halloween 2. He's since returned to the industry as an assistant cameraman. Walter Buck Flower, one of the three fishermen on the boat, also shows up in Escape from New York, Starman, They Live, Body Bags, and Village of the Damned. He passed away in 2004, but had a very long, distinct character actor career, and we probably know him best as the homeless guy on the bench in the Back to the Future movies. Oh, very cool. And he was also a screenwriter on a lot of exploitation films throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the most popular of which was probably Bikini Car Wash Company. <laughs> a 
classic. Yes. Written by the drunk guy on the bench in Back to the Future. Amazing. <laughs> who also plays often crusty fisherman, crusty janitor, just all around crusty guy. <laughs> when you got it, you got it. Yeah. The actor John Strobel, who plays the dude in the supermarket, will show up again in Escape from New York. The makeup artist and ghost performer Rob Botin would become a legendary figure as the creature designer and special effects supervisor in The Thing, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we're going to be talking about him a lot in that film. And that led to a career which includes Legend, Robocop, Inner Space, Mimic, Seven, and Fight Club. Very cool. This was actually like one of his first big works after just working as an assistant for several years. Makeup assistant Steve Johnson would become the makeup supervisor on Big Trouble in Little China and did a whole lot of schlocky horror throughout the 90s, like the Return of the Living Dead and Howling sequels, as well as animatronic creature effects for The Stand, Spider-Man 2, and The Cat in the Hat. It's probably the one and only time we will mention The Cat in the Hat movie on this podcast. <laughs> Not if I have anything to yeah, do with gonna it. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll find a way. <laughs> Costume designer Stephen Loomis would also go on to do Escape from New York. Associate producer Peggy Brotman would be a production assistant casting agent on Escape from New York as well. This was the first of a two-picture deal that Carpenter had with Avco Embassy, and the second will be Escape from New York. As I said, the film was shot on a budget of just over $1 million, but after wrapping and cutting the film, they felt that it just wasn't working very well, so they received an extra $100,000 and one year later went in and reshot a bunch of footage. I actually put together a chart kind of showing what all was reshot and re-edited. I'm sure we'll bring up a lot of it here in the discussion because I did pass it along to Alex and Julia to take a look at. And we did indeed read it. And that's about all I have for production details. I do also have the novelization by Dennis Etchison, who was a popular short story writer from the 70s and 80s and a friend of John Carpenter's. And I did not read it in preparation for this because I've tried reading it twice in the past and I just find it an insufferable bore. <laughs> I kind of forced myself through it when we covered this film on I Hate Love Remakes a couple years. And I just, it's based on the early draft of the script. So it doesn't have any of the juicy stuff added in. And he just also has a very dry prose style that just, it was very flat. It's actually probably easier to find Carpenter's screenplay online than it is to track down the novelization. So just go track that down because the screenplay was an absolute delight to read. And Carpenter's scripts are always worth a read if you can. He's got this very tight, sharp writing style that if you like to study screenplays, is definitely worth tracking down. That's all I got. That is more than enough. That's awesome. So I should probably say that, yes, I did cover this two years ago and I hate love remakes. And if you want to hear about the remake, which I'll probably bring up again at the end of the episode, but if you want to hear a full review of that, visit IHateLoveRemakes.blogspot.com. Yes, you've spent an awful lot of time with this film. Yes. There was a remake? There was a remake starring uh, Superman. Which Superman? Tom Willing. Smallville. Willen from Smallville. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> I'll bring it up again near the end, just kind of run down for you guys what they added or changed there. And it's the only remake of a Carpenter film that Carpenter was somewhat involved in was him and Deborah Hill produced it. John Carpenter executive produced it. And he agreed to just because he wasn't quite happy with how this film turned out. He's like, yeah, let's take another stab at it. Mm -hmm. But she sadly passed away of cancer while the film was in production. So that was the last time that Carpenter and Hill ever worked together or anything. That's really sad. Especially when you see the film and realize how it turned out. Yeah, fine. Yeah, the less said, the better. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, anything anyone else needs to bring up before I get into the synopsis? No, I think you summed it up quite nicely. Okay. And I look forward to getting to the point where I stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> 100 years ago, the town of Antonio Bay was established after a ship, the Elizabeth Dane, crashed into rocks in a horrible disaster. It turns out the ship actually carried a wealthy leper colony, and the town founder sabotaged it so they could steal the gold and keep their region free of disease. On the anniversary celebration, a fog rolls in, bringing with it the dead crew of the Elizabeth Dane, who start killing people until they get their golden stop. The end. That, yeah, sums it up nicely. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and there's people running around and being characters and stuff, but that's the plot. <laughs> that is pretty much the plot. The rest is all kind of like, I, would, I was going to say icing on the cake, but it's not really that much icing. It's just, you know, little yeah. bits of coconut on top. <laughs> we'll get into it. Yeah, we will. Absolutely. So, Alex, do you recommend this film? Do I recommend this film? Um, every time you ask me this question, I'll have a different answer <laughs> for you. The first time I saw it, I did like it. The second time, I very much did not. And this time, I kind of did again. It was kind of a right place, right time kind of movie. I wanted kind of a spook fest late at night. And that's kind of how it turned out. Is it good? 
It's okay. You could see uh, where the good movie begins and kind of ends throughout. And you could see with your notes as well what they did cut in and cut out. There's a lot of atmosphere that's kind of tampered with by showing too much. It's like showing the shark and Jaws in the beginning, kind of. But I'm going to say, yes, I did enjoy it. It does succeed on several levels, except for the ending, as we'll discuss. Julia, do you recommend the film? Um, no. I think I might also just be in a kind of a grump. (laughs) (laughs) But I just wasn't feeling it. There was a lot of good things about it, though. Mm -hmm. I, I don't hate it by any means. There was a lot of parts I really enjoyed. But as a whole, I wouldn't look forward to watching it again. And I don't think I would bring it up in polite conversation. All right. This podcast is ruled by our fickle whims and emotions, by the way. (laughs) Noel? I was actually sitting here debating this because I went in actually to this entire project like a year ago when we started, expecting this to be like the first big film that I'd already seen that I I knew I probably wasn't going to recommend. And then last month I recommended Better Late Than Never. And I'm like, (laughs) can I recommend that and not this? Though they have very different problems. And yeah, yeah, I think I am. I'm going to recommend Better Late Than Ever, but not The Fog. All right. What's I'm the odd man out. Never. That's the uh, movie at the senior center. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I've just been calling it the old people movie. We recorded that one like a few <laughs> months ago. So <laughs> Seniors on a train is what it was called. Yeah. I don't think yep. I ever actually put to memory the title of the film. Just oh, the yeah. old people movie. Oh, yeah. It doesn't really totally match up with the what the movie's about. It could have got a better name, but yeah. that's what it was. Okay. All right. I think it's an impeccably well-made film. Mm-hmm. I think the characters are good. I think... It's crafted beautifully, especially when you consider the low budget. I think the location work is great. I think there's good characters, good actors. The dialogue is nice. There's some really nice scenes of suspense and fright in there. It does kind of capture that otherworldly seaside ghost story feel. There's just no plot to it. Not really. There's no foundation holding it together. This is stuff that's happening. These are characters who run into it. And there's a great build to this film, but it doesn't ultimately build to anything. There's no real mystery. There's nothing that really needs to be done in order to solve the situation, other than like just some simple stuff that you can figure out from the very beginning. It just doesn't feel like it has any meaning or weight to any of it. Hmm. It's not a bad film. I appreciate it on a technical level, but it's just not a very interesting story. This would have made a great half-hour episode of Night Gallery. Yes, very much so. It would have been perfect. The way it's shot, too, is very Night Gallery. Focus it on the priest and the Janet Lee character facing the reality of what happened. Have the opening bits, have the ending bits, and then that's pretty much your half-hour episode there. I'd like to point out that I'm very much on the fence with this one, so with the very lightest of volleyballs, I can be knocked off. (laughs) Again, it's one of those ones where I'm kind of on the fence like I was last time. But the last one still had a lot going on that interested me. It just wasn't as well made. This one is well made. It just didn't have the foundation. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And in the material that I covered for all the reshoots they did, they didn't really change anything. The story is still exactly the same. All they really did were add in gore shots, showing the creatures more in full. You got to see them in face as they basically take boat hooks to people. They bumped up the characters of Nick and Elizabeth giving them more of a relationship. And we're we're in open discussion now, so feel free to chime in anytime you want. Of course. They bumped up those two characters, building a little more relationship between them, and then they added that entire chase around the rooftop with Stevie. I like that material, but I don't agree with the idea of turning it into a gore flick, because there's no reason this couldn't just be like a PG throwback to like the old 50s, 60s horror movies, like the old Val Luton films. I think they do lose a lot of suspense by... Okay, let's show the boat hook going right into the neck, and let's show the maggoty face of the demon and all that stuff. You can actually see the original design of the ghost in several shots still, but then they brought in this complete new redesign. It's just not as interesting. I think you hit the nail right on the head there with the word suspense. A lot of it's taken away. I think they still have a little bit, because there, of course, is set up before the ghosts come out. I could see why they wanted to bring the ghosts in, because I'm sure it didn't test well, if they even did that at that point. But yeah, they definitely lose a lot of potential. It could have been like a real creepy or eerie movie to go back to those old EC horror words. But um, yeah, yeah, it really could have been something special, I think. I just think like the whole premise Mm -hmm. is very silly. When you think about like, it, pirates, ghost pirate ghosts, pirates. yeah. So you have, I think you have a choice of whether you want to be silly, which is great, 
I want to see a campy, fun adventure with ghost pirates, kind of like a Archie's horror. But they aren't even pirates. They're just fishermen mm-hmm. and colonists. Or, you know, if you want That's to true. have, like, it take it really, really seriously. So you have a really silly premise, but you make it terrifying. Mm-hmm. But it's so, like, middle of the road. It's neither silly and fun, nor is it super scary. It's just kind of somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Somewhere in the fog, if you will. And for not being pirates, the captain looks an awful lot like a pirate in the end. He's, I can tell he has a hat and like a cutlass. This is stuff that the remake actually brings up. You know, like you have the aspect of them being a leper colony. Leprosy never plays anything else into the movie. No, not really. In the remake, it does. You have the ship that they were on is called the Elizabeth Dane. You have a character who's a hitchhiker who wanders into town named Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Yet there's no connection between the two. The remake corrects us. Just a wacky coincidence. Yeah, they should have put her more into the center of the action, or either of those two, because they're kind of just like interlopers into the plot. They kind of just come in, do what they have to do, Mm -hmm. and then kind of get out, which is almost every single character. Every character is just kind of chilling in their own corner, waiting to be intersected. (laughs) They're just kind of there. This stuff happens to people who aren't them, and then they wander into each other in the end. Well, yeah, the whole thing is, like, low stakes. Yeah. Like, eventually, when we get to the end, all the people that died, I neither knew nor really cared about. It wasn't yeah. like I felt any of their deaths. I was just counting bodies. So I'm just yeah. like, do we get to six yet? Because they don't really have any connection. Like, the priest has connection yeah. to the um, conspirators that started this whole shenanigans, but uh, no one else really does. No. It's the three fishermen, the old babysitter, yeah. the, the, <laughs> the weather guy. <laughs> that all teamed up to stop these people from basically living a mile away. And, like, one of the big differences in that script that I read was it was 12 will die. Yeah. Exactly. So what they were going to do was they were going to kill everyone in that church, not just one. Which would have made it high stakes instead of low stakes. stakes. Yeah. But even then, you have this entire town full of people that are just there and you never see them or hear what happened to them. Well, like the fog comes into town, but except for the characters that were falling, there was a 30-person turnout to yeah. this celebration. Yeah. I mean, we're talking one heck of a party here. Did they get the shelter? <laughs> Did they survive the no. night? What happened? I mean, where was know? the massacre that I was promised by yeah. these people gathering? <laughs> At midnight with candles. Exactly. To see a statue vaguely. In the dark. In the dark, yeah. yeah. Why was this? It was at midnight. Do you know when you have town celebrations? Mm-hmm. Um, not at midnight. No. You do it, it during the day. Yeah. It's almost like they were, in fact, commemorating these poor people being murdered because <laughs> that's when it happened. Well, and that's the thing is the statue that they're celebrating is a statue of the ship crashing against the rocks. Which you never show. No, they don't. Again, they describe it in the script and that's in the background. Yeah, that's again, they never show it. Why were they happy about the ship crashing against the rocks? There were certain things I missed in the plot. I think it was more they were celebrating the lives lost on that ship as part of the foundation of the town. Oh, okay. Because the money that was on that boat was supposed to help fund the town. But then in the end, it got turned into a cross anyways. So what? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I I will say there were a few things from that script that were even changed between that draft and the initial shooting of the film. One was in that script, instead of having the gold cross, there's just a chest full of gold coins. (laughs) Yeah, which it would have been ridiculous. (laughs) I think they just simplified it that for the visual. Mm -hmm. The father got killed when he was giving the cross back and they instead put that ending where they'd come back afterwards and kill him. Always a cheap ending, the return of the creature. And also, there was this whole sequence involving an elevator in the lighthouse. But when they were doing location scouting, the lighthouse they got was a short lighthouse instead of a tall one. So it didn't Uh, have an elevator. Okay. Because that was a creepy scene. That sounded like with just the elevator of nothing coming up, Mm -hmm. that would have been amazing. All that they reshot for the lighthouse was that roof sequence. Oh, okay. Which was something that was completely added. It was just supposed to be she goes out on the railing while the thing inside is coming towards her, and then it goes away. Which I found creepy. Like, it was an effective scene. Like, they shot it really mm-hmm. well. But, again, why are they attacking this woman as well as the people in the church? It doesn't really yeah. make a lot of sense. And not this town full of people. You can get 12 people in, like, three seconds in the middle of town. Yeah, and it's they obviously felt that this film didn't work, but I don't think they fixed the right things. No, there's a lot of logic flaws that they just left wide open. That was actually one of the things that Carpenter brought up in his commentary was people always kind of give him crap because the ghosts don't follow any logic in this film. And he's Mm. like, but they're ghosts. They're not supposed to have any logic. I get that to a degree, 
it still just doesn't have any narrative sense to it. Yeah, it's the ghosts of these poor lepers that were killed, but they move around like serial killers mm -hmm. and seem to know exactly how to operate all electrical equipment and mess it up. Yeah. So if the ghosts kill you, how does that... Because I know it was reshoot, so maybe it was never explained, but the scene in the coroner's office with Stephen King, where he's talking about how it looks like he was under the water for like a month or whatever. Yeah, yeah. How does that work? I, I think that just sounded scary. I think that's It what does sound that. scary. Yeah. They should have talked about that more. Yeah. They pump your lungs full of water and make you decay. I don't know. It seems to be the case. Because he said he had stuff. like the silt underneath his fingernail. Yeah. yeah. Like he'd been under the water. They said that for the entire boat. It looked like it had been submerged for a month. Yeah, it had rusted. Yeah, and that was really cool, but they didn't really follow up on that. They didn't do that where, like, the lighthouse starts decaying or there's, like, rust yeah. at the side of the doors when they start with the fake outs. Yeah. Or, you like, you see someone get full of water. I mean, again, production limitations. It was a very low-budget film. Absolutely. They were basically men in probably black stockings. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. I would have been happy with a conversation. Yeah. yeah. Like, where the coroner comes back. Get some evidence or something. I That's don't know. True. Or like, what happened to the weather guy? Like, where did his body go? They just drag him out and probably, I don't know, yeah. keel haul him. <laughs> what does keel haul mean? It's pirate talk. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> I want to understand. I don't know. Teach me your salty talk. Well, lass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing Alex with his leg up in a Captain Morgan pose now. <laughs> We're going to pick this up later. It's true. <laughs> Again, a lot of these threads are something that the remake actually does pick up. That is one of the positives about the remake. Mm -hmm. From a plot standpoint, the remake builds on a lot of the threads that are just left hanging here and underexplored. It's a horribly made movie. Yeah. Horribly miscast, but it at least has better... I don't want to say better storytelling. It has a stronger story. Poor Tom Welling. He's still hanging around Vancouver waiting for someone to call. Spoiler, I don't recommend the remake, but again... <laughs> yeah, that's true. On paper, the story is stronger than what we have here. You mentioned Stephen King before, Miss Julia. How Stephen King was this movie? To me, very. Starting with the opening quote, that always puts me in a Stephen King kind of mood. He always uses quotes in the beginning. I don't know if he still does. I haven't read one of his books in a long time. Although it was California, it was very many. Yeah. This seems like a Nightmares and Dreamscapes or like one of his short stories. I could see that. Dennis Etchison, the horror writer who did the novelization, is not only good friends with John Carpenter, but he's also good friends with Stephen King. And also Dennis Etchison wrote in the mid-80s a screenplay adaptation of The Mist that he was trying to get filmed. Oh, really? Now, is The Mist the movie where your body gets turned inside out, or is that still just a Simpsons episode? Still just a Simpsons episode. I really think we got something here, guys. <laughs> Can we move it. forward with our script where we turn <laughs> bodies inside out? <laughs> Again, that's also in an unrelated novel called The Fog by the British author James Herbert. Ah. Uh, There's a lot of mists and fogs out there. What is The Mist about? Dinosaurs. I'm sorry? <laughs> I think. No, it's like monsters in the mist. Instead of pirates, what if it were giant Lovecraftian tentacle beasts? Yeah, it's like this mist comes out and these people are trapped in a supermarket and there's monsters just outside the supermarkets in the mist and they're all, as he says, Lovecraftian beasts. Not interested. <laughs> yeah. So back to the fog. Yeah, I mean, the characters, it's good character stories. I like the characters. Like, I really like the Elizabeth and Nick relationship that builds. The scenes between them are nice. Stevie is a great character. The whole Father Malone thing and the Janet Lee character, eh, it fits the plot. That's exactly what they do. They're just kind of MacGuffins that just sit there waiting to spring into action when it's need be. I love that Janet Lee has Nancy Kyes hanging around with her to make her more interesting. Yeah, she's great, by the way. She was the Lee of this movie to me. Yeah, <laughs> I just love fantastic. her. fantastic. Yeah. I love Sandy. And that, of course, is the actress from Halloween and Assault on Precinct 13. Yes. And she's just bored half the time. Anytime someone's talking, she's like, that's great and all, but can we just get out of here? That took classical horror characters and added a Carpenter element to it with Sandy. I mean, again, I, I actually really like the Nick and Elizabeth relationship. What I like about what they did with the reshoots was they gave it more personality. She has the sketchbook. She's been hitchhiking for just a week and a half and he's her 13th ride. I love that whole conversation of, can I ask you a question? Are you weird? <laughs> that was all stuff added in the reshoots and I thought was really nice. You even had that bit down in the hole where he's telling her the story about his father running across the ghost ship. I like those characters and I love Adrian Barbeau, but what does Stevie really get to do in the story? 
I was going to say, do we just like the dialogue and actors? Because a lot of them yeah. don't really have too much character. Although I do, as you say, like that relationship because it makes more sense why she would hang around with them because they get along so well. Mm -hmm. Even though most people would be like, this is getting weird. I'm out of here and take the next bus out of town. Again, Nick and Elizabeth have great relationship and they're the ones who are basically investigating this mystery. But what do they really resolve through their investigation of the mystery? Not much. They don't. They run to the church and Father Malone does it. I kept spacing out a little bit and losing plot threads because I'm like, why are they investigating the boat? Oh, it was his buddy. His buddy was the captain of the boat. Okay, that makes more sense. And why did they call Stevie towards the end? Because I know they heard her talking about the fog, but what drew them to her talking about the fog? Like, what clicked with them that they had to talk to her? She had been covering a lot about the seagrass, which was the boat that was attacked earlier, mm -hmm. which was his friend's boat. Yeah, again, they called because the plot needed it to. Yeah, yeah, yeah it makes sense. And then Stevie, I love the idea that she's the only one with power who can say, okay, watch out, the fog is coming down that street. Watch out, the fog is coming down that street, which would make a lot more sense if that broadcast was going out to the entire town and we saw the entire town having to weave around this fog. That would have been really cool. I did kind of like that. It was kind of novel in that sense, using like the older technology. Mm -hmm. Rotary fight. Yeah, sight, yeah. <laughs> Line of sight. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but she's the only one with a generator and a radio in a lighthouse. It's true. But even then, the lighthouse that she's on is down steps on a point. How is she able to look down over the town? It's true. There's a weird geographical thing there that doesn't quite work. No. But it was a really nice looking lighthouse. Can I also add that uh, rotary phones add a lot more suspense? That's or, nine numbers. It's true. You got to wait for that to get back to zero before you can move so on. So much urgency where you're just like, zzz, zzz, come <laughs> on. <laughs> and that was another thing, too, was because of the way they reordered the scenes, when Nick showed up at the weather station and found out that Dan the weatherman was gone, Stevie was still on the line because, remember, she heard the entire attack that happened Right, to Dan, right, right. And yeah. so they talked again more there. But yeah, it's interesting that she has to rely on these people she hasn't met to save her son. Mm -hmm. It's like there's interesting ideas here, but again, our heroes don't really do anything to alter the story. It's all just because of a final line in a journal that the only reason we don't know about it is because the father said, and I stopped there because I couldn't read anymore. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. And it's also to find gold that's buried in the wall right underneath where the journal was. Exactly. There's no mystery to where is the gold? How do we find the gold? What do we need to do with the gold? How do we appease these ghosts? What do we do with these ghosts? What do they want? There's no mystery there. You don't have any steady progression of unfolding things. It's all just this shit happens and in the last five minutes, okay, here's how you resolve it. The whole thing felt like a video game, like a game of Resident <laughs> Evil, where it's just like, you found the journal. Now go to talk to Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did the gold coin turn into a piece of driftwood that was also the name of the boat plate? Magic. Yeah, they were giving them clues as well. They're just like, yeah. hey, hey. Well, the ghost used the gold coin to catch the boy's attention so that he would pick up the wood. I don't know why they thought the wood would. Why did Stevie bring the wood with her to work? I don't know. These ghosts are tricksters. And what are they doing out in the middle of the day? Yeah, they have weird powers. Where there's no fog. They're like, first we're going to prank the town and set off their car alarms. Well, no, but they're in the water. They're in the water. <laughs> yeah, like they did all this big show the night before, and then when they came back, none of that happened again. It's true, yeah, there was no car alarms going off the night. Again, that was entirely added in the reshoots, too. That entire sequence of all the electronics going off, the guy in the supermarket, her chair moving, the car alarms going off, that was all added in reshoots. And nothing really came of any of it. Consistency. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you went back and reshot that, that means you just chose to not put it in again later. There were lines in dialogue from the early thing where they're talking and she's like, yeah, my dog wouldn't stop barking at midnight. Oh, yeah, that's when my car alarm went off. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the townsfolk are like, oh, this is really weird. But the townsfolk, for all intents and purposes, are pretty oblivious to the entire events. Like it, only the people in that church who are really know what's going on in yeah. the lighthouse. Yeah, they were too busy with their candlelight vigil celebration. <laughs> you will not let this go. I have problems with it. Big problems. That doesn't make any sense. I planned some events in my day, and that is shoddy work. A candlelight vigil centennial anniversary celebration where we look at a statue of the horrible, horrific tragedy that killed a bunch of people that we, oh, secretly were all responsible for and stole their gold. 
Let's I'm, get up in the morning. It's, yeah. It's the centennial today. Let's wait. Yeah. Let's wait all day. We could be eating ribs. Having hot there chocolate. There could be a midway. There could be all kinds of things going on. Nope. We're going to wait till midnight. <laughs> we're essentially, we'll be the next day and not the centennial, but whatever. And then have a celebratory quiet sit in the dark. <laughs> we're from a pretty small town. Do you know anything about when that town was founded? <laughs> I know that there is a bang or <laughs> <laughs> once a year at the fairgrounds, but I think that's to celebrate Victoria Day. It's not as sexy as it sounds. <laughs> it is not. It's basic. Although there probably might have been some I've read enough things. Stephen King to know that Bangor isn't sexy. That's kind true, yeah. Thing going on. <laughs> I didn't... <laughs> Teens like to explore. <laughs> but I mean, with all the stuff that they had in the reshoots, they said was scanners had come out. And it, because of its extreme gore and violence, had like completely changed the face of horror. And so they were worried that this quaint little ghost story film just wouldn't work among that audience anymore. Not enough exploding heads or Michael Ironside. But you're not really adding anything that's particularly scary or shocking. You're just doing hook hits. Well, yeah, the gore effects are pretty piss poor. Pretty tame. You don't really have any splashes of blood. It's like nobody's head gets ripped off. The only real gore gore shot is that one maggoty face of the pirate guy. Yeah. Which, again, is nothing that you really couldn't have shown on TV back in the day. I think they were afraid to do a PG horror movie because this would have been PG. There's Otherwise, there's no nudity in it. Other yeah. than a few shits, there's no bad language in it. There's nothing in this that you couldn't have played on TV back in the day. Which doesn't make any sense why everyone wants to make these things R because you want to get as many stupid teens into the theater as yeah. possible. I think it would be scarier if it was just a bunch of people getting pulled into the fog personally. Yeah. Like the babysitter disappearing just as he closed yeah. the door so he doesn't see that. That is scary. Or even the weatherman, most of that weatherman sequence is still as originally shot, where it's the shadows of the struggling figures silhouetted in the doorway. Mm -hmm. You just had a couple of extra inserts of the hook hitting his neck. But otherwise, that would have been more interesting. For sure. I don't think that any of the stuff is bad. I don't think it ruins the film, but I don't think it fixes anything either. Yeah. The only thing that I thought was a nice addition was Stevie climbing up onto the top of the tower, just because that's an extra dramatic beat. And it was pretty cool. They did it really well done. I was getting kind of like very nervous and agoraphobic about it. Yeah, because I knew that they had to kill one more person. Well, it's not going to be Stevie. It's going to be the priest, right? And then when the hook goes in her neck, I'm like, oh, shit. They got Stevie. <laughs> They're going to kill her. That's amazing. Don't worry, they don't. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> Stevie's not signing off. I was for 30 seconds there interested. It's true. What I also liked in that moment, you have that bit where she gets hooked in the shoulder and she just rips out the hook and starts hooking the pirates herself. Yeah, she's great. It's Adrian Barbo. What are you going to do? It's a good little hero moment, but again, mm -hmm. it doesn't resolve anything because she's still relying on the other people to save the day. It's true. Through means that she doesn't understand or know anything about. No one really knows anything. Everyone kind of has half the story, but everyone sort of acts like they have the full story. Like, no one should have privy to some of this information that they act like they do have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, when he was asking her question, she's like, well, it's a fog, and uh, it goes in the opposite direction of the wind. Pretty spooky. That must mean it's full of ghosts. Ghost-filled fog. That's right. The Here's worst. an important question, guys. <laughs> what is a stomach pounder? <laughs> Good question. I want to get to the heart of this movie, and I need to know. It's Pop Rocks with Coke. It's taking Pop Rocks and Coke at the same time. I think it's a regional thing. Regional. Yeah? Do you think it actually exists? Like in California? I think this is supposed to be set up on the New England coast. No, it's in Northern California, because she's on her way to Vancouver. Oh. oh good okay. eyes and ears. All right, then. That's what they have over there. Yeah, because they mentioned they're in California, because I would have thought they were in Oregon or something. Or right, right, Washington, right. but she does her, like, sexy nighttime voice. She's yes. Like, California goes. So they must be oh, right okay. up north. Oh, California. You were actually listening to her broadcast. Very good. I like geography. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, I didn't pick that up. So I need to Google stomach pounder. To see if it exists. Stomach pounder with Coke. Yeah. It's true. Can we get a link Hold to that, Hold the fries, please? yes. Thank you. <laughs> and I know also that John Carpenter was so in love with that location that he actually bought a home there. Oh, that's nice. Wait, <laughs> it's kind of scary. They also returned their Village of the Damned, the remake, is filmed there as well in the same town. Oh, good to know. And then in 1995, his house burned down in a fire. Oh, not a happy ending. Sorry about that. That was me. Not many happy endings in Carpenter Land. Julia, what It was a happy about? ending for me. Oh my god. You have issues. I'm filled with a lot of rage. <laughs> Plot twist. 
Uh, some things that I liked, since you asked. Yes. Because I have some notes here that I... They're so non-sequitur that I can't possibly bring <laughs> these up. The priest, I enjoyed very much his scary leap out of the dark. Yes. <laughs> I don't recall that. Where he just springs out of the dark and surprises Janet Lee. When Janet Lee uh, uh, is like, where's the priest? He's like, hello. <laughs> Good evening. I'm right behind you. <laughs> I've been drinking <laughs> since John. Or most likely since yesterday. <laughs> My main note was, best case scenario for a hitchhiker ever, you get a lover, yep. a partner in sleuthing. Yep. <laughs> it's a win-win for everybody. Also, I'd like to note that considering the climate of this location, an open Jeep seems an illogical choice of automobile. Yeah, like, it's true. It seems how, like it's uh, a rain central. Like, yeah. Her hair doesn't move, because I'm pretty sure there's about 800 pounds of fixed net in that thing. Yeah. I like the continuity, though, that in the end of the film, they're driving around with the truck, and the truck still has its windows blown out from the night before. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. A lot of candy glass getting broken in this movie. Candy glass? Why would you say it's candy glass? Because, A, it looks delicious, and B, whenever someone smashes into it, it just kind of, like, melts inward rather than shattering. Yeah, that's how glass works, no? Oh, I guess you're right. Yeah. I would draw. Well, yeah, but car windows are different because they have that layer of plastic in them that causes them to pebble. There you go, yes. I have a note about the all-instrumental radio station, because <laughs> everything she plays is sort of like jazz or funk. I'm going to call it Boring AM, <laughs> That's playing right. all the non-hits you didn't want to hear. K-A-B. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, my greatest note about the death of Andy the Weatherman. That's his name, right? No, that's her son. Andy is her son, Dan, Dan O'Bannon. Dan the Weatherman. <laughs> Dan O'Bannon, the co-writer, co-director of Dark Star, was the Weatherman. Awesome. <laughs> Yes, he is the first character I've seen who died from mansplaining. Because <laughs> she is trying to warn him, and he's like, Honey, come on, I know my way around a fog bank. What the fuck? <laughs> Given that he was also the mansplaining police detective in Someone's Watching Me, that makes a lot of sense. That's true. Charles Cipher, mansplainer extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first. We can blame him. I do feel sorry for the janitor, though. He really never came up again. He just wanted to get paid. That's true. He did. <laughs> well, he had a weird name, too. It was like Bevan or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> uh, and the... then the priest, like, oh, wait, finds uh, out. Did you recognize who was playing that guy? He, ha he was a guy. Was uh, it John Carpenter? That was John Carpenter. I knew it because the two guys. As I'm like Bennett. I'm like, oh, okay, Bennett. I'm like, these guys both look like John Carpenter because they had the mustache and the longer hair. So yeah. there you go. He just rang the bells and left. It's true. That was John Carpenter who was so embarrassed by it afterwards that he's like, I'm not going to play any more bit parts. Oh, Hitchcock dreams dashed. Until I host Body Bags. Exactly. <laughs> Which he did a great job, I think. I didn't even <laughs> notice it wasn't an actor, so. Everyone's their own worst critic. Look at Lee. She thought she was bad. Yeah. Bringing it back to Lee again, by the way, which I will be doing <laughs> all the way through this podcast at the end when we do a retrospective about Lee. Yes. I really like Sandy, but I mean, I think I really more just want her to call me. <laughs> to uh, hang out? Yeah, I really want to hang out with her. Nancy Kyes is retired, but she's still around, does a lot of interviews. I had this thing where it's just like, Lori, uh, I pictured that was Lori changing her name and hitchhiking away from Haddonfield <laughs> and then gets mixed up in here. Not again. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. But my favorite character was the priest. I think he was pretty badass. First of all, the leaping out of the dark was amazing. <laughs> the best line ever, which is, we are all cursed. <laughs> but yet does nothing. <laughs> just stays in his church drinking. on top of the He's hill. He's just drinking, drinking up there the whole time, which is yeah. awesome. My only problem is that he just wasn't really much of a character. No, no, no. He's just a... a... He was a plot necessity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was a classic trope. Him oh, yeah. hugging that cross... Yeah. It was amazing. Where he's just, at first I thought he was trying to protect himself. Like they were vampires. <laughs> Does this work? And that's the thing is, I don't mind that they melted the gold down into the cross. It was an interesting prop. That was a good idea. It was a nice visual. I'm going good idea on that one. And I like that he was such a brave bitch at the end. Where he's just like, I have to pay for the sins of my grandfather. I'm the sixth conspirator. Fucking take me. And it's such a cheat that they didn't take him and then did at the end. They're like, thank yeah. you out. And that's the thing is in the script as written. They just take him then and there. Yeah. He catches on fire and both him and the thing catch on fire and boom, that flash of white and everything's gone. I just liked his hero moment and then yeah. it was robbed from him. I know. They're just like, thanks for the gold. Bye. Yeah. Which would have been a great ending where they figured it out before they achieved their end goal of these six people. And then at the end, it's just like, nope, we also want the six people. We're jerks. With the cross, though, why stick that in the wall and not just have it be the cross in the church? 
Yeah, what was the end game for that? They wanted the money, but because they just I made it so you couldn't spend that. He hid it in the form of the cross with the intention of later selling Retiring it. Retiring on it. But he was so torn up by the guilt of it that he couldn't spend the money, so he hid the cross. Again, what the remake does. Don't kill lepers to get gold. Yeah. See, in, in the remake, the entire town was built on the gold, so there's no gold left. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So all that they're after are the conspirators and specifically the people descended from the conspirators. Revenge. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the Adrian Barbeau character has this really like sultry send off where she's just like, fog is bad. Uh, the warning about fog in the future. At this point, she doesn't even know that her son's okay. No, or if the power is on, she could be talking to nobody. That is a direct reference to the thing from another world. Where uh, it ends with a reporter getting on the radio, giving this thing about watch the skies. Whatever you do, watch the skies. That's a direct reference to not thinking something through and it not making any <laughs> yeah, sense. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't make a lot of sense. It was a pretty silly way to end it. See, and that's the thing is, you know, we kind of picked apart Halloween. This is kind of that taken to a further level. Halloween is Citizen Kane compared to this movie. I oh! <laughs> See, but I mean, John Carpenter... The more he gets into supernatural stories, the less he really thinks them through, and he just kind of falls into the trap of, I can do anything. Yeah. Well, he's very much a mood guy, like, yeah. when you get into the nitty-gritty of the supernatural. Even when he's kind of doing the comic booky action films, it's still kind of grounded in some level of believability. Like Assault on Precinct 13 was really weird and wild and over the top, but also very grounded. Mm -hmm. So the plot was much cleaner. Plus, they have a very much a point A to point B in the action films yes. where they have to get this guy, do that thing, survive this night. This, the plot just goes. Woo. In the supernatural stories, we kind of saw this with Halloween and we're really seeing it with this and we will see it with a few others is what's a creepy thing I can think of and I don't need to justify it because it's supernatural. Yeah, for all we know, he could have been just talking with his buddies and said like, man, would it be cool if like the fog came in and took some people? All right, let's yeah. make a movie around that. And I'm not saying explain everything. You just need to at least know while you're writing it what the logic is. Yeah. So that there is still that underlying foundation. I just need the most basic of logic. Just a little bit. This is why this is happening. Yeah. Like, I really am not a nitpicker by any stretch of the imagination. It's not so much even just what the ghosts do. It's just that there's nothing. They still just didn't build a story out of it. No. This stuff happens. People react to it. And that's the movie. I think it'll be interesting moving forward because you guys obviously have seen way more of these movies than I have. Just because the things that I really like about the movies so far are the things like the conversations between mm. two people, the parts that I really enjoyed besides kitschy stuff was, as Noel said, the conversation they had in the boat, Jamie Lee Curtis and the man's man guy. Tom no. Atkins. That is a good description <laughs> <Yeah>. of him. <laughs> um, it's, it, I mean, it makes no sense as far as the plot. No. Uh, it's incredibly dark for some reason. I can't see anyone's face, but it actually is a really nice, tight little scene as far as it being like mm. a little vignette. So I don't understand how stuff like that coincides with stuff like ghost killers. Yeah. Like, I don't really see the connection in someone who's an artist or someone who's a filmmaker moving forward where they're just like, why isn't someone telling you to play to your strengths here? Like, your strengths is not this. It's character. Your, your murderers and your ghosts and your stuff, they make no sense. But you can make two people sit in a room and make me fascinated. Yeah. Here's what I think. Halloween was an unexpected success. They made a film, they were proud of it, but it, when it first came out, as Carpenter was talking about here, they thought that it had bombed. It got so-so reviews, it didn't do big business, so he went off and did Elvis. While Elvis was shooting, and we know how well Elvis turned out... Amazing. It was a few months after Halloween was released that he really started getting the buzz that it had been re-reviewed, critics were now loving it, it was doing gangbusters... So there were a lot of expectations to, okay, how do we follow up on that? So it's like, okay, what's a scary movie we can do? What's a scary thing we can do? And they put this together. And even after they put it together, they're like, it's not scary enough. These other horror films have come out since Halloween, like scanners that are pushing the envelope. How do we make it even scary? And it's like, this isn't a film that feels like it was a driving story that he needed to tell. It felt like something that was thrown together because he had now become a trend and he needed to follow up on that. He was still a young filmmaker at the time. He felt that he needed to live up to the expectations that were now on him because of Halloween. So, I mean, moving forward, how does that pan out? What I think is uh, you're going to be disappointed more and more. Well, yes and no. I think you'll be disappointed more and more in terms of his horror films. 
with a couple of exceptions. But the film that he does right after this, and we'll go ahead and say our next episode is going to be Escape from New York, is him returning back to those Assault on Precinct 13 roots. And so you get these kind of two distinct versions of John Carpenter. you got horror John Carpenter, and you've got action movie John Carpenter. I think the action movie, he's actually going to have a lot of good success in. Not always, and it's not going to be lasting, but he will still have some really good success there. Horror John Carpenter is still has one or two, but I think we're going to find a lot of the fog type stuff. And what do you think, Alex? What I meant, I didn't mean that she's going to be disappointed with the films we're going to get, because there's a lot of great films mm-hmm. coming that I think she's really going to like. I think that the main theme or Julia's arc throughout this podcast so far has been her sort of mourning a director that could have been, like a director who could have done dramas and comedies. Yes. That she saw these great elements of John Carpenter's career and dialogue that I myself personally did not see. And she's kind of bringing that out to yeah. show me in ways like the girls talking in the car or like the friendship between... um More Zuma Beach. Yeah, or Zuma Beach. And I think that, yeah, going forward, it's going to be interesting to see the diverging paths that he takes, that director who can make such great characters and great character moments and a great genre director. Yeah, I think he always has that gift for characters and that gift for dialogue. But yes, very few of his films are built around those aspects and focusing on those aspects. Those are merely just like here. They're just a part of the mix instead of the focus. Whereas with films like Someone's Watching Me or Zuma Beach, those were the focus. And yeah, other than maybe one or two more things coming up, those are not going to be the focus, sadly. Well, what I'm hoping is going to happen, which I mean, he's a really popular director, so maybe it'll happen. And you guys know more than I do, is that he will be able to take this power of subtlety and hone a skill of action and be able to combine them in order to transcend a genre. So that I'm hoping that we'll be able to create almost a new genre where we combine both great characters and amazing action scenes and then make an awesome movie of those two things combined. That's going to happen, right? I think it's called The Thing. (laughs) Do you feel that he already achieved that with Assault on Precinct 13? Um, I, no. Okay. I think it was definitely there. And I think that I was super into it and it was a great thing, but I don't think it had become its own thing yet. I think it was still an idea. Then I will say, and again, we'll see next month because next month is one of his biggest films, but I haven't seen it myself in probably like 14, 15 years. We'll see next month how that happens because I know Assault on Precinct 13 is very representative of the types of films moving forward that I am fond of. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're going to like a lot of these movies for sure. But but there is still that disappointment if he never makes again another Someone's Watching Me. Mm-hmm. He never again branches out into different areas like he did with Better Late Than Never and Zuma Beach. Starman probably comes the closest, but it's still basically a big action movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he pretty much sticks to he's either horror or he's action. The 70s are over. And the only time we're really going to branch off from that are a couple of Westerns that he wrote. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it is kind of interesting early in a career to see a statement so bold and then realize that while he's still going to do a lot of good work, he's never going to quite live up to what he could fully do. That's really sad. It sounds like a bummer, but there's going to be a lot of great movies coming up. There's still a lot of great (laughs) stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't doubt that. There's no way that he's so popular Mm -hmm. and everybody loves all of his movies so much without there being Mm -hmm. a lot of genuinely good stuff Mm -hmm. there. Because we are really just getting started with what Carpenter is famous for. Yeah, even people who are just like, oh, wow, you do this podcast or whatever. They're like, "Uh, I'm a really big uh, John Carpenter fan. I'm like, well, we did this movie and this movie and this movie and this movie. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm talking about John Carpenter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, Julia, I actually envy your position because you still get to discover a lot of the great ones that are coming up for the first time. Mm-hmm. For me, it's a little bittersweet because other than two films, I've already now rewatched my favorites of his. Halloween and Assault on Precinct 13 were among my favorites of his. We mm-hmm. got The Thing coming up, and then I got another one coming up in the 90s. But otherwise, it's a lot of films coming up that while I know I've enjoyed and, and I, I look forward to revisiting, from my past experience, they are ones that I haven't enjoyed as much as the ones we've already gotten through. Ouch. So It's going to be interesting. And I'm, I'm the fan saying, ah. Oh. <laughs> 
I still love you, Snake Plissken. <laughs> I'm really excited about Snake Plissken because I really liked his character in Escape from Los Angeles, and mm-hmm. I look forward to him escaping New York. Do you like camo tights? I <laughs> love them. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine, guys. I'm looking forward to this one because I haven't seen it since Escape from L.A. came out. Wow. Because my dad showed me the original and we went and saw L.A. in theaters. So, God, that, that was, what, 97? was. I was a long time ago. Yeah, I was, was a, a young boy. <laughs> it was over 15 years ago. Yeah, I would have only been like 13, too. Yeah, so, Alex, when was the last time you seen Escape from New York? Oh, my God, I can't even. Uh, I don't think it was that long ago. Like, I think it was probably around, I don't think it's been since we've been married or together. So, it's I've probably been, a, I would you. say, a decade. Okay. Yeah. So, it would be fun to revisit, finally, because I know this is considered to be, like, one of his pinnacle movies. Oh, Yeah. And especially the pinnacle of, I mean, this is what launched Kurt Russell's career. Absolutely. Kurt Russell had been a successful actor before this, but this is what made him a star. This is one of the most highest regarded, like, cult action films, like late night cult action films you think Escape from New York. It's one of the most successful films Carpenter's ever been a part of. One of the legacies is one of the big franchises that he's spawned, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it'll be interesting when we get there. But yeah, Fog is, I think, very much carpenter struggling to figure out what the expectations are of him it's a foggy fog yeah the fog it's easy to forget about oh and i think especially with you know following elvis he really wanted to go back and do something that i know is popular that i know i can have fun with all stuff but he it felt like a film where he's trying to live up to expectations instead of here's something i need to do escape from new york from my memory is very much him going back to his roots and building on it yeah okay and then we got the thing coming up after that. Yes, that'll be an interesting discussion for sure. So, Allie, do you are, you were on the fence before? How did uh, you I'm on the ground on my back. I've had the wind knocked out of me. Oh, oh, that's fine. It's the fog. I'm not going to <laughs> lose any sleep about it. It's not like when we went through the uh, awakening experience of Halloween. I'm that was rough, you guys. I'm yeah, sorry. no, I, I I see where you guys are coming from, and I think I'm back on the other side of the fence. And that's the thing is, you know, the fog. It's a very well made film. It's great to see just for the locations, for the uh, Dean Cundy photography, for the score, for Adrian Barbeau, for a number of the other actors. There's a lot of great technical merits to it. Mm -hmm. I just don't find it interesting. Yeah, it's kind of a forgettable piece. Like, it's well constructed, as you say, but it seems like it's just a movie that kids in the 80s were necking to and no one remembered. And again, like, Better Late Than Never, the reason I recommended that was, you know, it was sloppy, it was uneven, all stuff, but it was interesting. Yeah, it had more of a point of view. And it was really fun at times. Mm Mm-hmm. And this one, it's other than a couple of moments, it doesn't even have, like, a really fun element to it. Yeah, there's only a few times that I remember being, like, fun. Yeah, there's a couple of good lines. When they had that conversation in the bottom of the boat, and mm-hmm. uh, after the she got scared by the locker moving, mm-hmm. and then she was like, oh, that's it, I'm going to Vancouver. <laughs> and uh, it's all, actually, both Jamie Lee Curtis and scenes, when they're she's having the beer at the bar, yeah. and then they decide to take off, and she goes to leave the beer on the bar. He's like, nah, take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to need it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but again, they're like characters that are interesting, but they don't have an interesting journey. Mm-hmm. No, not really. They don't do anything interesting or have anything interesting. So it's like characters without a story to tell. This is a film that I wouldn't watch, even as an old fan, because I saw this first in like the early 90s. And I've seen it a few times since then. It's just not a film that I really feel the need to revisit. You're not going to really learn anything new about Carpenter by watching it. Yeah. You're not going to see anything that he doesn't do better elsewhere. Can we leave the fog in the fog of our memories? (sighs) Yes. Nailed it. I mean, even Rob Bottin, who does the creature effects here, it's like, well, yeah, but then the thing happens where he does creature effects for Carpenter with the same cinematographer. So, I mean, it's like a lot of what they do there kind of renders this one very out of date. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I really, like, yeah, I don't think I'll ever watch it. I, this is my third time watching it, and I believe that will be my last. It's like I was watching Tom Jane's Punisher, and I'm like, you know what? I'm never going to watch this movie again. <laughs> I think I've gotten enough out of it that I need to get out of it. No, Tom Jane Punisher, I like to throw on every few years. Yeah? Because there's parts that I really enjoy, especially the fight with the Russian. That is the best part in the whole movie. But anyways, that's the Punisher. Imagine John Carpenter's the Punisher. Yes. Oh my god, that would be amazing. Starring Tom Atkins in the 80s. I would have been like <laughs> Death Wish times 10. That's the other thing is, I like that Tom Atkins looks like a normal guy. That he's a leading guy, and this isn't even the only Carpenter movie where he's the lead. He's the lead in Halloween 3. Where he's a good actor, he looks like a normal guy. He's, I mean, he's not stunningly good looking. Nope. He looks like your friend's dad in grade school. 
Yes. That's exactly right. Wait until you see him with a mustache. Oh, God, I'm excited. <laughs> I only really know him with a mustache. He's the one from Night of the Creeps, right? Yeah, he's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah, he's pretty much in all my, like, favorite B-movies, basically. <laughs> he still pops up and stuff. He's still a big character. Yeah, he does. Him. I see him every so often, usually as a chief of police or something. Now, when you say mustache, are we talking handlebar, full caterpillar? What's happening? Uh, No, a good man mustache. No handlebar, nothing yeah. like that. He's a very manly man. Suit strainer? Like a good soup strainer, yeah. He's a manly man, but not annoyingly so. God, I love a mustache. I know you do. I wish I could grow a good one for you. Your mustache is just fine. <laughs> yes, he's the sheriff in My Bloody Valentine 3D. Yes, he is Halloween 3. Yep, I remember him in Halloween No, no, My 3. Bloody Valentine 3. Oh, sorry. My... Oh, yeah, so he is. Yeah. So he is. That movie had 3D boobies. It's true. It did. As did Piranha. Let's not talk about Piranha. Okay, stricken from the record, Your Honor. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> any, any final thoughts <laughs> we have sassy. on the fog? <laughs> Uh, no. No, I think, uh... I said it, and it was amazing. You did. It was a foggy Leave fog that's better off in the fog of our memory. Yep, it's true. <laughs> fog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag fog. <laughs> fog this movie. Again, it's not that it's horrible, there's just nothing to it. No, it's true, I've already forgotten it. Which is a shame, because they made the hell out of it. Yeah, they did a good job. They put a lot of work and effort into it. They even came back a year later and put even more work and effort into it. They just never stopped and were like, but we're not building this on top of anything that's interesting. I blame yeah. the muffin lady. I think she was calling it in. I think so. I think People she were have... undernourished. <laughs> Their blood sugars were low. They're like, what is this, flax seeds? <laughs> <laughs> she was trying something new. <laughs> <laughs> and it failed. Yep. Sorry, so, yeah. Fog. Yeah. The Fog. Hell, I'm excited about the next one. Yep. And we've, we've already kind of talked about what we're doing next time. So uh, I think that brings this episode to a close. I think so. Sorry to bum you out, folks, but trust me, the next one is going to be uh, quite a conversation. Unless it's one of those ones where because we haven't watched it for a decade, we're going to end up horribly disappointed. Well, even better. I think we got a lot of material out of the fog, a lot more than it was warranted, I think. So, yeah. And I'm very much looking forward to Julia's perspective coming in as a fan of L.A. who's never seen New York. Absolutely. It's going to be interesting. I hope it's as much of a delightful romp as I want it to be. <laughs> there is no surfing. There's no Steve Buscemi. Well, Steve Buscemi was the only reason why I watched Escape from L.A. I'm just warning you. But we get Ernest Borgnine. Yep, it's true. And we get the Duke of New York, played by Isaac Hayes. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's not start spoiling everything, because even I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't remember that. There you go, yep. <laughs> but yes, as the final reunion of John Carpenter and the actor who played Napoleon in Assault on Precinct 13, the fog is a letdown. It's true, and very sad. Though he is great in that scene. He is great in that scene, and we wish him well in yes. all future endeavors. Uh, he's dead. Well. We don't know what's going on. It's true. <laughs> there could be all kinds of heaven-based frivolity happening. <laughs> Hopefully with no ghost pirates. Yeah, well, I don't think there's ghosts in heaven. <laughs> that, would ne that would mean that there's another afterlife. Double after ghosts. Double ghosts. <laughs> I hope it's not like a citizenship program where, you know, you need to apply to go from ghost to heavenly spirit. Oh, God. You know what? Heaven needs more bureaucracy. Am I right, guys? Yeah. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Come on. Let's just line up for the buffet and chill the heck out. It's true. Because you can't swear in heaven. <laughs> See, all halos are actually made out of red tape. It's true. Oh. oh. <laughs> Why did that upset you? That really bummed me out. <laughs> <laughs> So good night, you are everybody. a silly person. Good night, good night from a <laughs> Masters of Carpentry. I said made a fail. Masters of Carpentry. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J A K L O C K E.com. Yeah, and it's, um. Oh, shit. <laughs> Just realized I didn't press record. For. at all? The Skype call is recording. Okay. But my main record that I record in Audacity, I forgot to turn that on. So uh, no. So. <laughs> uh, we should be okay. You fucked okay. up. We should be okay. <laughs> It'll be fine, I'm sure. I just at least like to have these two because never can fully trust the Skype recorder. Of course, yeah. Better safe than sorry.
So I've started recording now just as we're only wrapping up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you did it first, No. It also had 3D labia and it didn't make it any better. Did it really? She was full no. frontal. Was she full frontal? I don't remember this movie. I don't remember 3D labia. Uh, <laughs> she was full frontal the entire scene. It wow. did not make it a good scene, though. <laughs> and also that entire scene, the guy that she's fucking is the screenwriter of the movie who wrote himself in a scene where he gets to fuck the naked lady. Oh, buddy. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what a jerk. I hate my bloody valve. I, I know you do. I know you do. Yeah, you've heard that episode. I have. I have. You guys went full tilt on that one. <laughs> yeah, and I'll see because I'm actually going to be going down to New Orleans for a week near the end of October. Come back alive, Noel. Please. <laughs> what are you doing in New Orleans? Angie and Jack, who do the monthly midnight movie exchange with me, live there. Oh, okay, cool. Well, tell them I say hi. <laughs> so me and uh, you know J.D. DeMott. I do, yep. Uh, me and him are going down there to visit. Oh, very cool. So it's like a little uh, made of we'll fail. Together. Kind yeah. Of, yeah, that's very cool. Well, I'm sad to miss out on that. Though. Keep safe, like, no. Sounds Keep like safe. fun. Yes. Yeah, no, I should be okay. I'm sure it's fine. The city is haunted. The city is very haunted. <laughs> <laughs> Keep a buddy with you. Pirate ghosts. Oh, pirate ghosts. Place. With me. That's yeah. true, you will. Just throw them to the pirate ghosts yeah. and run. Yep. Yeah. And Angie and Jack have lived down there their entire lives, so I figure if anyone can fight off people. Or it's they true. could already be ghosts, yeah. and you just don't know. See if you guys can get some stomach punchers on the way. Yeah. And Jack is himself a rock star, so he can just tip people with a guitar. It's true, he does. He does our wonderful intro music, and thank you to him. Yeah! Ghost rocker! <laughs> what could go wrong? Ghosts. Pirate ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> the pirate ghost of New Orleans. <laughs> so yes, don't watch the remake of The Fog. I have, and I will not again. I remember it being a very, uh, like, not bad, but like, boring. It's just sloppy and yeah, boring. It just, I can't yeah. imagine it not being boring if TV Superman is the star. That guy yeah. has no emotions. He does not give any emotions. You think he gets better after that? Yeah. And he's not the only one. The entire thing is completely a miscast. Yeah, well, I couldn't blame him totally. I mean, the Adrian Barbeau character is Selma Blair, who I've seen do good in some other things, but she's completely flat there. She's usually Selma plays kind of like a dry, flat. yeah, dry yeah. character. I think the only reason they hired her was because of the smoky voice, and that's about it. Yeah, maybe she was riding high on the success of Hellboy. But I mean, I think plot-wise, it does a better job of building the story in an interesting way. It's just the execution is the direction is just kind of sloppy and boring. The effects are the effects are really bad. They do fill in the blanks, but like Halloween, filling in the blanks does not a good movie make. Well, I think it's one of those ones where it, the filling in the blanks was a good idea in this respect. Well, to cover up those things, yeah, but it's still. Halloween, yeah, it was just, it's Rob Zombie. Yeah. But, yeah, and then, yeah, the cast is just flat and the writing is flat. It's just, it's not good. No, it's not a good scene. <laughs> I record an entire episode about it. You can go listen to it at IHateLiveRemakes.blogspot.com. <laughs> <laughs> plug, plug, plug. I've, of course, heard every episode, so I'm in the know. And The Thing. Do you have The Thing? I don't own The Thing. Um, it me, huh? Yeah, it's strange that I don't. Uh, I don't really have any horror movies in the house, especially okay. uh, since we started popping out babies. But uh... My sister saw Alien 3 in theaters on her ninth birthday and loved it. Wow. <laughs> Fair Nine enough. is a long way away. How did she see it at nine? I had to wait. It was rated R. <laughs> it was, uh, my mom didn't find out until after. Okay, that's that explains it. It was one of my sister's friend's moms took them both out to see it. Oh, uh, I was obsessed with Aliens, and I had to wait until my yeah. dad could rent it for me for Alien 3. My mom was not happy that she saw it, but my sister loved it. Well, that's nice. <laughs> it is a good movie. Nothing scared my sister. Some people have that gift. Yeah. I do not have that gift. Even nowadays, my mom hates having her watch horror films because my mom doesn't like horror films. Uh, but if one's on, my sister will just crane her head over and just start watching it. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, you both have a good night. You as well. Good recording. Have a good trip, Noel. Be safe. I, well, you'll probably talk to me again before then. Nope. <laughs> She's decided. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then we'll wait two months before recording this paper from New York. There you go. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll see you before you. We'll talk to you before. I don't leave until the day before Halloween. So it's it's know. mostly going to be early November that I'm going to be out there. So. All okay. right. Look out for Michael Myers. I get to go down there, have a New Orleans Halloween party, Ooh. and hang out for a weekend. What's your costume, No. Uh, I don't have one. No. <laughs> get your shit together. What's your costume? <laughs> you got to start what's working on that now. What's your game plan? What's your game plan? Break it down for me. Come on. Crazy pickle on the head, it's man. It's New Orleans. I could just strip down to my tidy whiteies and call it a costume. That's nope. true. You'd be the only one without a costume, nope. so yeah. No, nope. unacceptable. 
I need you to give 100%, Noel. <laughs> And you start researching. Get the silly putty. Become the creature from another world. The thing from another world. <laughs> I need you to be clever, but not too obscure. It's true. That's my problem. I'll have to get a kind of like big bushy wig, grow out my mustache a bit, gray it, and then walk around with like three packs of cigarettes and I can be John Carpenter. There you go. I think you've got it. I think it's going to be too obscure. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. But anyone who does know is going to be a cool person. <laughs>